Alrighty. Welcome back to Nick Linda's Comic Corner Classic Less Known Classics. This is episode number 1502 and episode number 1396. Yeah, with this we have one physical trade and some issues from two separate series. One of those series has the last couple issues of a series collected in this very trade here. I'm also going to be discussing a four-part story arc from Batman that, to this day, since the story has come out, has never been put into a trade paperback. I'll discuss it soon. Alright, first up it is Sinestro Volume 4, The Fall of Sinestro. This collects issues... 16 to 23 of the Sinestro ongoing series, along with, get this, the last two issues of Lobo Volume 3, 12 and 13. And that is it. Now, this story arc is pretty much, pretty much the entirety of this thing is set on Earth. I'll get to the Lobo stuff, and its inclusion in this trade is so bizarre. It feels completely at random at best. It's almost like you could say the last series could going to take place after the events of this series. Oh, don't worry, we're discussing it. Now, the issue opens up with the Sinestro Corps arriving on Earth. Because, well, they're the protectors, they're protectors of the universe now because the Green Lantern Corps is gone. So where is it? So where does Sinestro go? Kuwait. Uh, Karak, I think it is. It's the country ruled by Black Adam. Yes. And here's a fun fact to you when it comes to this particular appearance by Black Adam. This actually is his first appearance since Forever Evil. Yes, which means at the time when this issue came out, he had not made appearance in a year. Like, in no comic book. You're like, really? Yes, really. And there's a funny joke in this one where... Where you have Sinestro basically standing next to Black Adam. He's like, what, does this country only have one chair? And then he just creates a chair out of a... Of a... Well, this is quite hilarious. He he makes one out of his own ring. And then, and then you have Black Adam saying... Well played. He just laughs at it because he thinks it's quite funny. I think it's funny too. I think it's just so hilarious. The fact that he actually did this. Mm hmm. Yes. And. Yeah, the thing is about Black Adam and the current continuity, he hasn't appeared a lot in this continuity. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Like. As far as I can tell, there's no real explanation of why in the world the guy hasn't appeared that much as current continuity. I mean, his first appearance was in the pages of Justice League. Well, let's get my nose here. Yes. Now, his first appearance was actually in Justice League Volume 2, Number 0. Yes. He appeared initially in the Shazam backup feature... For Justice League as a recurring villain in that and then he did appear as sort of a he then was resurrect or apparently at the end of the feature in issue 21 he died and he was resurrected in his own one shot for Villain Smith which to date has not been put into trade for some reason I would have thought it would have been put into the trade hit back for Justice League Forever Evil but nope it's not there because that issue led into the main event of Forever Evil where he ends up fighting freaking Ultraman. And aside from appearing in that, he also appeared, well, a little bit, like, a couple issues of Just Like Volume 2. He's, well, during that period of time, he also appeared in one issue of Justice League, in the, in, pretty much in the finale. He also, well, let's see, he, well, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute, well, And then pretty much wrapped it for every... By the way, he did almost make a cameo in Batman Album Volume 2, number 34, and the issue of Batman, Inc. Yeah, he appeared in Batman, Inc. Mm-hmm. Yep. He's also appeared recently in the issue of Aquaman. He's appeared, like, sporadically all, like, all over the place. Mm-hmm. Yes. And then pretty much, like, wrapped the events of Forever Evil, his next appearance was in Sinestro. Because I don't think he made a physical appearance in any other book right after Forever Evil, which is kind of odd. 
Like, you have him come back, and then you have his next appearance in Sinestra, of all things. Which is kind of interesting, to say the least. Yes. Now, after he pretty much appears in the story arc, he's appeared in a lot of books. He appeared in issues 5 through, ni- uh, five through 9 and 11 12 of Doomsday Clock. He appeared in Endless Winter. He's appeared as sporadically as a recurring character in the pages of Justice League. He actually became part of the Justice League just recently with issue 59. Actually, 58. He appeared in like few issues before that, but with, with 59, he pretty much has a regular stay in the book. He's appeared in... When it's just like Doctor's Pride to Endless Winter. He's also appeared in the first issue of Blue and Gold. He's had his own Year of the Villain one shot. He's appeared sporadically since his story arc wrapped up. But he's an absolute great character. I personally love this character. I love the fact it's time to shine. I'm glad that Colin Bunn gets a chance to write the character because he's a great character. So we actually have it where we have sort of this vault of wisdom that only it gets the holy place in Kuwait. So, Black Adam agrees to take Sinestro down, but only him, nobody else. So, we have Lisa Dark basically coming in that says, like, when he Sinestro, when, when Black Adam says, like, oh, is this your, is this your concubine, your, your wife? He's like, no, she's my record keeper. Despite the fact he's actually slept with her. Yes, he's actually had sex with Lisa Dark. And he tells her, Okay, so if you can't go down, I will be recording it on my ring, so you get a chance to hear everything. So they go down to this tomb, and Sasha admits that fact that he used to be a archaeologist before he was a lancer. Which I'm like, I'm thinking that that kind of is true, because he was some kind of scientist prior to becoming well, remember the the Green Lantern Corps. And they go down to the tomb and they can pass some mummies. Yes, some actual mummies, despite the fact it's a different country. And then they come across this this body of this supposedly the, a pale bishop. And it turns out to be a guardian of the galaxy, a guardian of the universe. And Snatch reveals, oh yeah, there's something they're immortal that can die. And he says, I can, pr- I, I, that is definitely proven. So he, they pretty much bring all these big humongous creatures to Earth. And Sinestro needs help, of course. We also see that Sinestro's daughter just partying before while well, this is before this all this is going on. And then they run into Wonder Woman of all people, who's wearing the David Finch costume. Yeah, David Finch is, drew this costume. He gave her this costume. And he uh for what he's mentioned, I think he mentions in an interview, he actually loved this costume for her. Excuse me. It's one of the few comics she's actually appeared in when she wears his con- wears his costume. It's not Wonder Woman. Aside from this book, she also wore it, wore it in the pages of Superman and Wonder Woman. And I think that was it. Because initially put, she wore this for one story arc in the pages of Wonder Woman. And then she stopped wearing it. And speaking of the truth, we do have, as you in the cover, we see Superman in a t-shirt. Yes, this is during the period of time when he was running around with a t-shirt, when he was had some power, but not a lot. Basically, the storyline was very mixedly received when it came out. I mean, I thought the story was okay. It just felt as it was dragging too long, and the fact the explanation for why in the world his powers got the way it did was really out of control, and the fact it was due to his new sunburst power that kind of, well, indirectly led to this. And it turns out the person responsible for this was Vandal Savage. And the way to cure his whole thing, apparently his cells were blocking out sunlight. That's why he was losing his powers. So the best way to basically get rid of this, the, these particular dead cells was to have him basically exposed to a bunch of kryptonite. Which apparently burned away those cells. And then later on, his powers were fully restored. He looked back normal. So, Snatch so recruits various people to, to his core to fight out these pale bishops. Who do you recruit? Wonder Woman, Superman, Scarecrow, which I think everybody basically can tell. Yeah, it was completely obvious. Deathstroke. Yes, he recruited freaking Deathstroke. Let's see, who else? Oh, yeah, he recruited Harley Quinn, the demon, Etrigan demon, John Constantine. Yes, John Constantine as a, as a, as a yellow core lantern. 
I thought that was funny. I mean, the guy uses magic and he's got a space ring on his finger, which they haven't actually shown using it. They came with the freaking dead man of all people. Yes, I thought that was kind of funny. Eventually, after that's defeated, all the temporary lanterns basically got the power removed. Though, the only person who actually wanted to keep it was Scarecrow, which that would have been something. Heck, even Black Adam gets recruited to the core, which I thought was so interesting. And after it was issue 21, due to the fact that Snatchel's Star Sarnak has become very popular with the Snatchel Corps, he pretty much appoints as the leader of the Snatchel Corps. He's taken over as a leader, and this will pretty much take up the last couple issues of the series, and this will later lead into the events of Hal Jordan and Snatchel Corps number one. But what about the Lobo issues? Well, before I discuss those, I have to discuss... Because these issues actually follow up with something happened in the pages of Lobo. First, let's discuss, basically, DC Sneak Peek. This is Lobo. Yes, a 11-page short story that was printed in the, in the, as a backup feature for Convergence Green Lantern Parallax. Now you're probably thinking, okay, what's the story of this one shot? Well, you have Lobo sleeping with, uh, apparently he's hired to kill some woman. And they end up, based, well actually, you know, it's a guy who really wants to kill somebody who's actually in his bed. Who's in his wife, and it turns out to be the pretty Lobo. Who ends up killing him, and apparently his wife has got, well, not really a big issue with, with it at all. Like, oh, use me. A few times, in fact. Look at his husband down on the floor. Oh yeah, he was a cool man, and basically sleeps with, and she basically continues making out with him despite the fact she's holding the knife that killed her husband. And then he just basically kills a bunch of people. And then he receives the bounty to go after Sinestro. Yep. And then was continued in the pages of, of course, Lobo number 7. Yep. Lobo number seven. Well, technically, what happened with the 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 bounty? That's not followed up with into the Lobo annual, believe it or not. Yes, because for the next two issues, you just have Lobo just doing Lobo. What basically, pretty Lobo is written like regular Lobo, where he kills a bunch of people, uses the hook. Basically, he's known for using, and sleeping a bunch of random random alien women. He also apparently comes across the woman he slept with in the DC sneak peek, runs into her, and then, of course, starts making out with the two-headed woman, who he starts chasing, and then, of course, and he basically just makes out with them, which they enjoy making out with him, and then they die, and, well, he goes to the various alien species, and this is kind of what he does for the next few issues. Just goes out to random people because that's what Lobo does. He also comes across this green-skinned woman, which, oh, don't worry, we'll be discussing her because she makes a comeback after this after this three-parter wraps up. Well, you think it, it concludes in the annual, but nope, the annual has got nothing to do with that at all. The annual itself mostly deals with, well, Sinestro Core. And you have him basically go after a Thanagarian... It's been basically Lobo just doing Lobo things. Mm -hmm. The story kind of concludes with issue 9. Of course, he's targeted by the Citadel, which I believe these guys are old enemies of the... The Omega Men. Yes, the Omega Men. They're old enemies of theirs. Mm -hmm. Yep. And after fighting them for the, these few issues... And you think, oh, to be continued in the Lobo Annual? No, it has nothing really to do with that at all. And then, of course, last two issues published this thing, picks up, like, not long after this, follows all this plot thread of him going after the woman, him meeting up with his Cesarean princess, which apparently was the only person who survived, his plan was from him. And he just does, like, other things, and he says, I'm a Cesarean, and that's where the thing ends. I'm like, Wow. Here's the thing. I am not really a fan of the Lobo comic. And you're thinking, why the heck am I not a fan of the Lobo comic by Colin Bunn? 
Well, it had an interesting start to it, but it had my, my final thoughts on this series. By the way, I do have the first trade that collects the issues of this run. Yes, here it is right here. Where my problem with this series is, is that since the character's debut, we have apparently the build-up, this big, epic fight between the pretty Lobo and the actual Lobo where they really wanted to kill each other. And it happens. Off panel. Or apparently the battle's already happened and then he apparently kills the real Lobo. And then this is ignored by DCU. By, by DC Rebirth. Yeah, it's completely ignored. And he had this sort of very weird three-parter. And then you have him... I think basically him getting connected with this, with Sinestro was probably more interesting thing happened to him. Which didn't last very long. And then they had some couple issues that kind of wrapped up the series. It's an interesting run, per se. I think Helen Bunn did a terrible job with the series. It's just that... Well, this should have been the actual Lobo. Not the pretty Lobo. The actual one. And you might ask, okay... Did this guy actually appear after this series concluded? Yes. Yes, they did. He actually appeared for a three-parter in the pages of Batman Superman. And then he made one more appearance after this. Yeah, and you're probably thinking, where the heck did this guy show up? In the issue of Hal Jordan and Green Lantern Corps. Where they just properly retired the character. Oh, yeah. It was at the conclusion of the bottom light storyline. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that was roughly four years ago. I think Venditti basically probably heard all the criticism against the Pretty Lobo. So... He just basically had him tossed aside, and he was never brought up again. And then not long after that, we had the return of the real Lobo in the pages of Justice League vs. Suicide Squad, which that later led to his, his involvement with Justice League America by Steve Orlando, which was really good. And of course, the guy has made sporadic appearances since then in the pages of Justice League No Justice and appearing in the, in the story arc for Teen Titans. And also, of course, that like I said, when that book came out, that was simply a sales. That was simply a ploy for a sales boost, in order to say a series that was not selling too well. The book got canceled, anyways. Now, currently, he's in a team up series with his lesbian daughter, Crush, who is a great character. All right. Oh, and by the way, I give this trade a nine out of ten. It's really good. I think the Lobo issue is fucking completely random at best. But, I have a question though. Why the heck did you include the Lobo issues for? I mean, at least in the case of the last trade, it kind of made sense. But this trade? Excuse me. Not really. It felt completely at random to include him. Mm -hmm. And no, I'm not done with this national series. There's still, a few, there's still one more trade left, which I'll hopefully get that soon. Alright, next up, I'm going to talk about issues. Batman. 659 to 662. Now, this is a four part in this grotesque. Here's the cover for the very first issue. And you're probably thinking, okay, you probably look at the. He said, Osrender and Mandrake. Are like, Osrender, as in John Osrender, the co creator of the creator of the Suicide Squad, Amanda Waller, and one of the most well respected writers in the last 30 years. He wrote this four parter with Tom Mandrake, a guy he's worked with before. On the book, on two books. He worked on his Spectre book and he worked on Martian Manhunter. Here's an interesting little fact though when it comes to John Osrender and this very particular four parter. It's John for him, it's his only four, the only issues he had worked on for Batman in his entire career. For Tom Mandrake, these were his return to the book, and after this, he never came back to the book. Yep. This four parter is kind of odd to say the least. Now, is this a terrible story arc? No, it isn't. This came out in roughly in the year of 2007, of all things. Yeah, 2007. Yeah, this these issues came out as sort of a... Kind of a fill-in issues for when Grant Morrison was on the book. To this day, this this particular story arc has never put into trade. 
Is it terrible? Not really, no. It's really good. Tom Mandrake himself does an absolute fantastic job drawing this. Like, here's how he draws Batman. It is so good. The artwork is so gorgeous to look at. Tom Mandrake does an absolute fantastic job with this. Yeah, it's just really good. The whole thing with Grotesque is that the Grotesque is this big hunchback serial killer. Yes, a serial killer. Who goes around killing people. And do they reveal who's behind this? This this particular plot twist of who they reveal the person is. Is a very much a cop. It's pretty much a carbon copy of the ending of Hush. Where they reveal that, that the grotesque. Let me show what the guy looks like here. Grotesque looks like this. This is grotesque. That's him. He's this big bulky guy with this hook. By the way, he kills criminals. He's basically, in a way, DC's taking the scourge in the world, killing random people. It's not like in the case of scourge in the world, killing known suit villains. This guy kills random criminals. Yep, and who is this guy, really? He's a doctor who appears in this, this story arc, who's, you know, friend of Bruce Wayne's, but not like a childhood friend like, like Thomas Elliot was. It wasn't obvious that in the case of Hush being, this being the Doctor, it was basically revealed gradually. But this actually is a pretty good story arc. It's not terrible per se. I mean, it's a good detective story. I still don't get why this is not in trade. Yeah, it's kind of perplexing. I mean, if you look at basically any issues, for from issues like 600 to like, oh, I don't know, like, 700 and like 13 this is the only story arc aside from last days of batman that has never put the trade there is no trade payback back to this thing what you thinking really yeah really there is nothing i mean what story arc came out at the same period of time as this well you had basically a story arc dealing with Batman and Son. Yes, the story arc they introduced Damian Wayne. Yeah, this is basically kind of like the, the story arc that came right after this opening story arc wrapped up. Yep. That's pretty much what this is. It pretty much comes right after that story arc just wraps up. They have this quick four-parter. And that's simply it for... Yeah, then, of course, we go to Ra's al Ghul. It's... I'm going to get the story roughly a 9 out of 10. It's a great story. It's a good detective story. Kind of wish it was in trade. Yep, kind of wish it was. Okay? So, yeah, that's particularly it for this particular review. Stay tuned. Uh, I might get time to back for If not, I'll do it tomorrow. Along with reviews for Case Closed. How Real is Hero of the Kingdom. And the case to Atlantis. Okay, to the next video. Bye.